Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Office 365 Deep Dive. My name is Sarah Queen, Senior Manager within our Professional Services team here at Citrix. I'm joined today by one of our most popular tips presenters, Ryan McClure, Senior Enterprise Architect with Citrix Consulting. We also have a special guest presenter with us today, Pierre Marmignon, Principal Architect from our Product Management team. Before we get into the presentation, let me quickly review a few housekeeping details. We will have a live Q&A session toward the end of today's event, and you're more than welcome to submit your questions during the presentation. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question window and click Submit. Also, we are recording this event, and the on-demand version will be available from the same link that you used to join today. So feel free to come back, watch the archive, or share it with your colleagues. Finally, the slides are available for download from the Event Resources tab located along the top of the interface. Okay, let me go ahead and pass it over to Ryan to get us started. Ryan? Thanks, Sarah. Before we get too far in, I wanted to just first cover some basics on what O365 really is and what it includes. I kind of like to think of O365 as Microsoft's version of a workspace, but for Office. O365 isn't just one thing. It's a combination of Office experiences across mobile, cloud, and traditional desktop clients to give the user as close to a familiar look and feel across all those devices and form factors as each of those platforms allows. So when we look at the question, is it a cloud app? Is it a mobile app? Is it a traditional app? It's really all of those things at the same time, which means that we have more to consider when deploying than ever. So the other question that we get uh, fairly often is, it, Office 365 still feels a lot like Office 2016 that I just pay for monthly. And for users that only leverage the traditional you know, desktop clients, there's some truth in that perception. But there's also a lot that Office 365 brings to the table that also really makes it a, a cloud service. Those things include over a, a terabyte of OneDrive storage per user, uh, hosted Exchange mailboxes, hosted Skype for Business infrastructure, cloud-based auth with Azure AD, web versions of Office, and, and more. So Office 365 is really more than just Office 2016 and the combination of OneDrive and Exchange. But those two things hosted on, as a cloud service along with some new auth and licensing considerations give us some new things that we need to figure out how to work with, particularly in a Citrix environment. Which brings us to our agenda. When we get asked about Office 365, not in a 10 times we're being asked about Exchange or OneDrive. So that's where we'll spend a good chunk of our time. For each, we'll go through some of the options that have been around for a while, pros and cons of those options, uh, tips and takeaways, and also some uh, new or lesser considered Citrix solutions that can help us with those challenges. We'll also jump into a few quick auth and licensing considerations. They're net new to O365 before we wrap up with a few items that didn't quite warrant their own slides, along with overall conclusions. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to type them into the question chat, and we'll try and get through as many as we can during the Q&A at the end. So, on the Exchange side, the challenge here is that orgs are now entitled to run Exchange online. Um, they can also continue to run it on-prem, but what this does is it violates kind of rule number one of designing a Citrix environment, which for years has been that the data lives close to the workload or the VDA. Well, now when the data moves up to the cloud and is hosted as a service, the user no longer lives close to, or the user session no longer lives close to that data. So what that means is that Outlook in online mode is now almost never deemed acceptable from a performance perspective. Um, and you'll see that this isn't just something we're saying, this is also something that, that Microsoft says as well. And this has even been true, honestly, when customers were hosting Exchange on-prem, that some customers preferred the user experience of cached Exchange mode. But what that means is we now have OS keys to deal with. So OS keys and the mail cache are part of the problem, but the other piece that I think often gets overlooked is the search index, which is a machine-based cache. 
So it's very difficult to try to roam on a per user basis. So for quite a while, we really had no way, aside from third party solutions that have existed in the, the ecosystem for a while, to deal with both the OST and the search index problem at the same time. We've been able to deal with the OST for quite a while, but that still leaves an element of the user experience lingering or to be desired. So to sum up the problem, we can either run Exchange online and have it perform poorly. It can become difficult to manage, or if we make the wrong set of decisions, it, it can both perform poorly and be difficult to manage. So again, at really, no matter where your BDA lives, provided that it's living in an on-prem on data center somewhere, Microsoft's official recommendation is to use cash exchange mode with Office 365. And that means that you know, we're officially in the world of OSTs. So what are our options? Well, before we get into how to deal with OSTs and what we've done there, one thing that often gets overlooked by customers is OA and online mode. So uh, three, four, five years ago, OA was uh, probably left something to be desired in terms of features and user experience, but it's really come quite a long way since that time. So it, it's not a, an option that should be overlooked. If the user doesn't require that full featured native Outlook experience or you know, maybe they're in more of a use case where it's kind of a kiosk workstation and they're popping in and out and just need to check and send a few quick emails, but OA may be a, a very valid solution to provide the user with access to email without introducing the challenges associated with OSTs. That said, it is a non-native user experience. We're not going to get that same Outlook look and feel that we get when we run the Outlook client, and that's simply not going to be acceptable for some user populations. So moving on to the next option that's kind of been around for a while, we can redirect that OST to a network share, and then you know, whether they're on a non-persistent VDI or they're accessing Outlook published as an application via Zen app, we have the ability to uh, have that OST remain even if the user session is moving between uh, different machines. So we're going to get a, a more native look and feel than OA. We're going to get a, a better user experience than online mode given that the cache is local, but it still doesn't address the, the search index challenge, and it, it definitely leaves some considerations around storage performance associate, associated with where we put that OST I also hear all the time that you know the supportability of doing that is sort of a, a consideration. So, you know, this is something that we've been doing and Microsoft has been doing for years. You know, even dating back to the days of PSTs, and they publicly document now that this is a supported option, provided that it is a, a high bandwidth, low latency connection. So, redirecting OSTs is something that's you know fully supported with a, a couple of specific caveats around the quality of the connection and that sort of thing. But you know, it is something that you know, dating back to the days of kind of pre-Office 2010 when Microsoft support stance was maybe a little more rigid, still makes plenty of administrators out there in the Citrix community uncomfortable, which is totally understandable. But again, this is something we've done for a while. It just still doesn't address that initial search index and performance uh, challenge that you know, we'd still be left dealing with. There are also third-party tools out there like FSLogix and Profile Unity, just as a couple of examples. Um, these tools address this, the challenge in some different ways depending on the tool, but some of them I have customers using quite successfully. So they're, they're definitely options to be considered. The, the con there is that they do add additional costs and you know, potentially some complexity in terms of configuration, administration, and overall environment support. The last option we have is to look at persistent desktops. Um, persistent desktops absolutely have a time and a place, and there are use cases where it's totally sensible to leverage persistent desktops. But if Office 365 is your only reason for delivering a user a persistent desktop, I would strongly encourage you to, to give a second look to some of these other options because persistent desktops do introduce enough challenges in terms of uh, ongoing maintenance and disaster recovery strategies and, and so on that uh, Office 360, 
five probably isn't the right reason to go from delivering a user a, a non-persistent desktop or a published application experience to now giving them a persistent desktop. So these are the options we've had around for a while now, but we have some new ones now. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Pierre from our product management team who is going to talk through a couple of the, the newer options available to deal with these challenges in the Citrix product portfolio. Thanks, Ryan. So um, the first option is um, the Office 365 user layer that is provided as part of our app layering solution. So uh, all Outlook-related data will be uh, part of a specific user layer and then stored inside the VHD. Please note that this does, this does not address, uh, as of today, the search index capabilities, which means the search index will not roam. So it will be uh, rebuilt uh, every time as it's machine-based. And uh, you require the app layering solution, which means you should already have image all your servers or uh, VDA workloads um, using the app layering solution. So what the catch with um, the Office 365 user layer? Initially, it was desktop only. Server operating systems have been recently added, so it's working in both use case. But you still need a profile management solution. It's really a layer designed to store the Office 365 related data and not the user profile. So please be careful with that and don't think it will cover uh, your user profiles in the entirety. Uh, Office must be part of the published image and can't be part of any elastic layer. If you're not familiar with the app layering solution, elastic layers are layers that are dynamically attached when the user logs in, depending on group membership. But in this case, if you want the Office 365 user layer to work, you can't assign uh, Office as an elastic layer. It's also supporting single session only, uh, so the concurrent access is not possible for now. And Again, like any other 365 solution, you need to plan for some additional testing time to make sure it's really fitting your need and working in your environment. It's. Then Citrix has another option, and it's part of the Citrix profile management solution, um, formerly named UPM, but a lot of people are still naming it like that, and uh, no named CPM part of workspace environment management. So the idea here is that um, the email cache, the OST file, will be roamed along with the user profile. So it will be containerized in a VHDX, uh, and it will include a per-user search index database, which means it's, it's addressing the search index database issue. Um, the engineering team has been working out to make this happen, and it's the first step of, let's say, a new way to address some specific issues here around Office 365 uh, in the user profile. So you can compare it to some of the third-party solutions Ryan has mentioned earlier. So what does it support? As of today, it's supporting Windows 10 and Server 2016 only. Uh, we have plans to uh, support broader operating systems and um, also broader outlooks because it's limited to uh, the 32-bit edition of Office Outlook as of today. Uh, we are using VHDX per OSs and we support single session, no session concurrency. Note that this is something we do have on the roadmap as well. We, we have to tweak uh, the Windows search surface, hooking it, so that's why we need to test a, a lot this solution and make sure everything is working correctly uh, with your actual Windows search service version. Uh, however, we've been really successful to adjust the code to any new release, and uh, a lot of customers are really happy with the solution. It's not available in the LTSR yet, uh, because it requires UPM 7.18, but obviously later in the time it will be available in the next LTSR. 
So a quick comparison between the two technologies. So in both technologies, we're redirecting uh, the Outlook cache to a VHD-like uh, container, but in the UPM uh, native, let's say, search experience, first of all, it's a little bit easier to set up because you do not need the, the full app layering stack to make it work, and it's including the search index. However, it has some limitations as of today. The team is currently working on them as it supports only Windows 10 and it does not support concurrency. So if you are already using app layering, the Office 365 user layer might be the best solution. But if you are not using app layering uh, as of today, it might be faster to implement the new UPM, CPM native search experience. Yeah, thanks a lot, Pierre. And I'm a huge fan of cheat sheets, especially when I have to have customer conversations maybe before uh, I've had enough coffee that morning. So we figured it might be helpful to put together kind of a, a quick comparison table of the various solutions we discussed and sort of what they addressed and, and what they don't. One of the things that I, I know has caught my eye every time I've looked at this slide is the cost implications. So when I see you know three dollar signs under the, the UPM search index and the O365 layer user layer, it makes me immediately think, oh I gotta gotta buy something. And that's not necessarily the case. The reason that you see those there is because each of these OST related solutions does require high performance storage. So it's more of an infrastructure investment than it is a, a licensing or entitlement investment. But from there, kind of, as you can see looking at the table, the option that addresses the, the lion's share of the, the challenges that we can see is the, the UPM native search experience. So aside from a couple of the constraints that Pierre mentioned around operating system and, and business supportability, which are, as Pierre mentioned, things that we're actively working towards, we're definitely going to be kind of urging customers to start down that UPM native search experience path and you know, decide if there's any specific reason that that's not going to work for them. It's the least complex to implement of the solutions that are particularly full featured. Again, if you're a customer that can get away with OA, you, you don't even have to consider one of those OST related options. And if that's the case, great. That's a, a good route to go for you. But if you do require that native experience, that's where we're really going to be kind of leading with that UPM native search experience. And then, you know, going with the O365 user layer kind of customer by customer as required if they're already down the app layering path or they're trying to do something today maybe with Windows 7 that they can't do today with the, the native UPM search experience. Again, if you're a customer out there that's redirecting OSTs and you are working just fine without the, uh, the search challenge being solved for you and your users aren't complaining, maybe it's complexity that you don't want to introduce just yet, but Aside from that, the UPM search experience is kind of going to be option number one here going forward for us. So some other tips and tricks to consider. Uh, cache exchange mode can have a significant impact on network and storage throughput demands, especially during first-time use. So as users are building that OST out for the first time, perhaps when you're performing a, a migration to O365, we've seen customers who have, have experienced 300-plus IOPS uh, demanded just as a, a single user was building that OST, and again, a, a fairly significant increase in network bandwidth demands. So you know, your mileage is definitely going to vary based on your network and storage parameters and all those sorts of considerations. But I think the key takeaway there is to make sure that you're doing some testing and baselining in your environment to understand how that's going to look for your users, and then sizing your uh, user migration waves appropriately based on what your infrastructure is ready to handle. Uh, the other thing we can do is limit the size of the OST where possible. One of the best ways to do that is limit the sync period to something like 30 days, um, and also consider the disabling the download of uh, shared and public mail folders if they're not required frequently by end users. This will help with first-time use IOPS, but not so much steady state. But again, still something that's worthwhile to consider you know, not only in terms of storage throughput demands, but also in terms of the overall size of the OST. So some key takeaways on the Exchange side of the house. Um, we've had ways to deal with Exchange online in a non-persistent or 
a multi-user environment for a while now, but they do have trade-offs, especially around that, that search experience and, you know, even going way back historically, you know, troubleshooting when PSTs or OSTs were redirected to a network share. But those are things that we've been doing for quite a while, a lot of customers with good success. But the real kind of change here is that we now have this UPM native search experience feature that deals with that search index challenge in UPM 718. So if you're an LTSR customer, yes, you may need to deal with the, uh, the consideration around moving to a, a non-LTSR version of UPM, but this may be one of those, you know, changes the way I do business kind of features that makes that adjustment worthwhile for you. It, it really comes down to the business decision and balancing the, the benefits against some of the considerations. That O365 user layer with app layering is going to be significantly more complex to adopt. And again, it doesn't address the search index capability. So if you're looking to introduce an Office 365 solution net new, the, the UPM search experience is probably the first place to look as opposed to the Office 365 user layer. But it is one of the options we have in the arsenal again. Be sure to, uh, to pilot and establish baselines. This kind of goes without saying across any technology that you're looking to adopt, but particularly impactful here when we're talking about some of the considerations associated with building that OST and the search index to a VHDX for a large array of users, um, potentially all at once, right? So that's where you'll understand what kind of the per user storage impact is, the per user network impact is, and you'll be able to extrapolate that out into what some sensible rollout waves look like for your organization based on infrastructure capabilities. And again, as we talked about on our little cheat sheet slide, all of those OST related options do require high performance storage. So make sure you're planning for that right off the bat. So moving on to OneDrive, you know, on the OneDrive side, I can't explain how many customers I talk to that are hard set on leveraging that one terabyte of OneDrive for Business data that they've already invested it in, and you can't really blame them. But this can make it uh, quite a bit more challenging to convince them to make uh, user data true Citrix files or, or share file data. But OneDrive for Business has a, a few snags to think about, particularly with the sync client and a non-persistent Zen desktop environment or a Zen app environment. So if we were to download all of that OneDrive data, every time a user logged into a, a non-persistent or multi-user VDA, we would be talking about some major hits to storage throughput demands and the same thing on the network side. There are also some supportability considerations where Microsoft straight up says that they don't support doing that on a server OS, and we can really only support um, that on-demand sync functionality on the fall creators edition of Windows 10. So in these scenarios, we really need an on-demand sync solution where the user sees icons for the files that they have available, but the files themselves aren't downloaded unless the user needs to interact with them. So again, without some other solution outside of the, the OneDrive for Business sync client, the, the challenge is we can't really create that positive native sync look and feel across multiple access types with non-persistent uh, desktops and maybe ZenApp access in a, a supported fashion that will allow our infrastructure to scale from a, a network and storage perspective as well. So you know, what are our options? Similar to uh, the exchange conversation, the OneDrive Online option is available to us. I, I've seen this one be adopted probably less than I've seen OA, again, just because users really want that native look and feel, but it, it is one that we, we have out there. We've also had customers try to redirect sync content to a network share or a map drive. Um, a few have actually had partial success as well. It unfortunately isn't supported. So again, similar to the exchange conversation, going with persistent desktops to address OneDrive for business challenges, while persistent desktops have a, a place and a time that they make sense to use, just doing it to solve the OneDrive and the Office 365 challenge really probably shouldn't be your only reason. Um, again, we also can't forget that those third-party tools like FS Logics and Profile Unity are out there. 
Uh, these do help address the challenges associated with OneDrive. Um, how they do that varies a bit by the solution, but they do add some cost and complexity. The good news is we have another option, and it's one that customers often don't really consider fully. So Citrix files, or formerly the share file client, namely the drive mapper uh, agent, can help generate or help aggregate rather that OneDrive for business data into the user session, regardless of the access scenario in that on-demand fashion that we really need, giving us that balance between the native sync user experience, manageability, and also in this case, supportability, which is critical. So leveraging share file and that um, on-demand sync capability, the experience is consistent across platforms and operating systems. It gives that kind of drive letter experience that a lot of users are accustomed to, and it's fully supported. The challenge here is that there is some user education required. Uh, a few elements of the configuration, like adding the connector initially, still do need some automating to require a reduced level of user interaction. And then there's always that perception that it's another enterprise file sync and share solution that we need to deploy. But that's not really what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to deploy a, a new place for the data to reside. We're just trying to deploy a new aggregator to overcome some of the limitations we discussed with the OneDrive sync agent itself. So in terms of tips and tricks when deploying ShareFile, don't lose sight of the big picture. Um, we may be deploying it to overcome those specific OneDrive for Business limitations on non-persistent or ZenApp workloads, but the solution's most powerful when we think about how data can follow users to other form factors, platforms, and clients like mobile devices, or in some cases, even the endpoint that they're on, as it makes sense based on the use case. Uh, we have a lot of customers get very laser focused on just the, the OneDrive um, challenge that they're trying to solve, and they lose sight of how that data could follow the user across their enterprise workspace. We also have customers that really want to redirect uh, profile and shell, folder, shell folders like desktops, documents, and downloads into ShareFile. While it's a great concept, it's not supported with either ShareFile or OneDrive, so something to be well aware of before you think about doing. Last but not least, again, while the third-party solutions that we discussed today do uh, address this OneDrive problem, the O365 user layer and our UPM uh, native search experience capability do not today. They are exchange only at this point. So don't implement those thinking that you're solving both problems. Today to solve both problems, you would be looking at one of them for exchange and then share file to address um, this OneDrive sync challenge. So in terms of our key takeaways for OneDrive, again, ShareFile is just the data aggregator. And we have available, particularly to help us with those non-persistent and multi-user VDA scenarios where the OneDrive sync agent either isn't going to be supportable or it won't be consistent if you have users accessing across both mechanisms. So the ShareFile option gives us a solid and supportable way to deal with uh, the challenges and scenarios presented without having to purchase additional software. If we do go down the third-party solution route, I just always encourage customers to uh, do their diligence and make sure that they have each of the vendors aligned on how different parts of the solution will be supported so that there aren't any surprises later. But again, we have customers leveraging uh, a couple of the options we discussed successfully as well. So moving on to authentication and licensing, um, always a fun topic in the Microsoft world, and some days I feel like I probably needed another degree to be ready to talk about it, but luckily Office 365 eliminates some of the challenges we used to have with Mac or KMS, but that doesn't come, out, come without a, a new set of considerations. So Office 365 allows users to install and activate on five devices, which is great. It also requires internet connectivity, by the way, which is a, a little bit different than in the past. But what about those non-persistent VDIs and ZenApp workloads? So with Office 365 Pro Plus, we have what's called shared activation mode. 
And this helps us deal with exactly these situations. There are three ways to activate it, either the ODT, registry key, or GPO. The key is that in this mode, shared devices don't count against our five device limit. If they did, we'd run into trouble pretty quickly. So with shared activation mode enabled, an activation token is generated and cached in app data local. In more recent Office 365 versions, we can then take this token and roam it to streamline the activation process in these Zen app or non-persistent VDI use cases. That token is then valid for five days and can be seamlessly renewed in the background when Office 365 apps open. Again, as long as they have internet connectivity, that way our users don't get the you know, product unregistered prompts that can be both confusing and cumbersome from an end user perspective. So now that we've dealt with activation, authentication is the other place where we can run into some unexpected prompts a bit unique to the Office 365 world. There are a few ways auth can be dealt with, but the key thing to understand is that um, not all allow for true SSO. So for example, in that first cloud-only option listed, there's no integration between AD and Azure AD, meaning that we don't get that true single sign-on experience. The next three that we have listed here are essentially various ways to achieve SSO either based on hash validation, password validation, or, ADF, or ADFS, while the last option allows us to leverage a third-party IDP if that's the way we want to go. So if all that is more than you want to remember, here's a, a quick little cheat sheet to help. More often than not, we want to go with one of those three middle options that presents users with a true SSO experience, reducing the number of prompts that they get. From there, we usually end up going with whichever standard our customers prefer, maybe steering them towards the ADFS option if we get a say, just to have some additional flexibility. But at the end of the day, as long as users are happy, we are, which is why we really try and encourage customers to go with one of those middle three options. Um, it, it turns out that users are almost never happy with those extra prompts. Who knew? So our key takeaways on the licensing front, uh, pretty straightforward when you boil it down. Shared computer activation mode exists. Use it and make sure you're roaming the token. On the auth front, we have loads of options, but not all of them allow for true SSO. So if you're heading down a path of one of those options that doesn't allow for true SSO, make sure that the ramifications are fully understood by all parties, including the user community and the business that's actually going to be consuming the applications on the end user side of the house, um, and really strongly consider going with one that does allow for SSO if you have the option. So some miscellaneous items and conclusions that we didn't quite get to earlier in the deck. We talked about online mode and Office 365 being a no-go. While that's almost always true for on-prem VDAs, it may be less the case when the VDAs live in Azure, and that traffic may be riding the Azure backbone. So if you're planning to deploy VDAs in Azure with O365, think about at least kicking the tires with online mode. Uh, you may go cache mode anyway. It obviously depends some on region, networking config, et cetera. But if you can save yourself from having to deal with OSTs and that user experience is favorable enough in that case, it, it's worth at least the test. Again, if, you're, if you have on-prem VDAs, it's 99.99% .99 chance that you're not going to get away with online mode. But with the VDA living in Azure, your chances go up a little bit that you might get away with online mode. Uh, on the activation front, we also found out the hard way that there are a few services that the activation process depends on that some customers either turn off as part of their image build or optimizations that they were looking to perform. So those services are the network list service and the network location awareness service. So just make sure that those are enabled or you're going to have some challenges with activation and chase your tail a little bit troubleshooting them to, to figure out exactly what happened. So in terms of key takeaways, you know, to answer that question that we get all the time, is Office 365 compatible with your Zen apps and desktop solutions? Yes, it is. So the, the first thing that we need to deal with to answer that question confidently, yes, is 
handling the latency to exchange is more important than ever, but we have new tools to help. Um, so the O365 user layer is definitely one option, but the option, again, that we're probably going to end up leading with is that uh, UPM-based uh, native Outlook experience that's going to help us deal with both the OST and also the user search index, solving both of those problems for us simultaneously. Those old school tools are still very much in the arsenal, so don't overlook them. And just be sure to test in baseline as you go through the rollout. This will both help you validate that things are performing the way that end users are going to expect that they should perform, and it will also help you establish what your rollout baselines should look like to make sure that you're doing it in waves that your infrastructure is capable of handling. The, on the OneDrive side, the OneDrive for Business Client really wasn't designed with non-persistent or shared environments in mind. So to deal with some of those challenges, again, we have the Sharefile Drive Mapper available to help aggregate that OneDrive storage data. We're, we don't need to convince customers to go wholesale from you know, OneDrive over to Sharefile and forget about the, the free terabyte plus of storage that all of their users are getting. Sharefile is just an option to help present that data to the user in a non-persistent environment in, or in a, a multi-user environment in a way that we can't otherwise do with just the OneDrive uh, sync agent. So if you are in one of those scenarios where you've got either non-persistent desktop or a, a multi-user ZenApp environment, don't put the OneDrive for Business Client into your images or you know, you'll likely have a challenge again unless you're using that on-demand sync capability of the Windows 10 Fall Creators Edition. And then the last kind of key takeaway is that licensing is handled differently in Office 365 than it has been in the past. So make sure that you're aware of and using shared computer activation mode, roam those auth tokens, and make sure that you're selecting an authentication approach that aligns with what your users expect in terms of the number of prompts that they're going to get. So how can we help? Um, you know, on the, the services side, we can really help with this you know, all the way from assessment of an existing implementation to design of a new implementation to actually going ahead and executing um, whatever strategy we land on. So these are just a, a couple of options we have available to us. We've got a, an environment assessment with, a, with an Office 365 focus. The duration here would typically be around a week, and we would do a kind of an overall review of the environment architecture, have some interactive discussions on leading practices and environment optimizations, really deep dive into the configurations in place around Citrix and Office 365 today, establish what the right go-forward solution would look like to integrate Office 365 into the environment or change how Office 365 is already integrated into the environment, and then do some high-level migration and onboard planning. On the experience optimization side, so the actual execution piece of things, this one would typically be a little bit more like two weeks in duration. The, the engagement features here would be, again, that deep dive review into Office 365 integration options like we've discussed here, um, selecting a technology to go ahead and deploy, assisting with the, the configuration of that technology, going through some functional testing, and then again establishing, based on the results of that functional testing, what our high-level onboarding plan should look like based on your environment and your considerations. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Sarah, who is going to take us home from here. Okay, thanks, Ryan and Pierre. That was a fantastic session. Before we move into the q and I'd like to remind our audience that if you have a question for our speakers, you can submit it in the Ask a Question area on your screen. Simply type your question into the text box and then hit Submit. In case we run out of time to answer um, your questions today, certainly keep an eye on the Citrix blog for a complete rundown of the FAQs that we received both in our morning event and um, this afternoon. So, but hopefully we'll have some time. It looks like we've got about 20 minutes left to get through um, what's in the queue. 
Um, while you guys are dropping those questions in, let me just cover a couple of last-minute tips. Um, our education team has been generous enough to extend a 10% discount for all of our TIPS attendees. So if you are considering purchasing training um, here in the short term, certainly check out bit.ly slash citrixedu uh, for additional information on how to redeem uh, that discount. Also, um, you certainly won't want to miss our next TIPS event um, at take, taking place on September 27th. Our uh, Citrix on Azure experts are back, both our um, internal Citrite and also we've got a, another guest speaker from Microsoft joining us. So that promises to be another great event in the Citrix on Azure series. Um, it's actually number three of the, um, the series that these guys have put together. So don't miss that. Uh, you can visit bit.ly slash Citrix tips to, uh, to register. Although registration isn't up, you can visit that page now and actually subscribe to the series and we will send you a note um, when registration is live for, for that event. All right, Ryan, I'm going to hand it back over to you for uh, Q&A. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Before we lose you, um, the questions are coming in about uh, sending the presentation. Those are in the Resources tab, correct? So they should already be available? Correct. Yes. So they're in the Event Resources tab. You should be able to very easily download the slides from today. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Okay. We've had a, uh, a couple of questions come in, so we'll start at the top and work through them. So the first one is, can we use the 715 LTSR VDA with UPM 718 to get the search index capability while still being on LTSR? So uh, I can actually lead off with this one. We actually have dependencies on the uh, 718 VDA libraries. So today that, that won't function properly, but decoupling that dependency is something that we are actively working on. Pierre, did I capture that right or you have anything to add? No, that's correct. Great, thanks. Okay, next question on the list. Uh, is the user layer for app layering still in lab space? So the Office 365 user layer is out of lab space, but the full user layer is still in lab space. Okay, next one down the list here. This one's probably for you. Does Citrix have plans to add OneDrive caching capabilities to either the uh, Office 365 user layer or UPM down the road? So um, I can talk about um, the, the UPM uh, thing and uh, about UPM. Uh, yes, we, we are really uh, thinking about and actually currently working on extending um, the UPM container technology we've added for Office 365 to be able to, to help our customers uh, working with uh, OneDrive as well. So that, that's something uh, we are currently investigating. Great. Definitely a good update. Um, okay, we have another question coming in here. With the uh, new OneDrive files on demand, does this help solve the issue with only the index being synced? Can a GPO force the user not to be able to issue the sync? I, I hope I understand this question correctly. So the uh, OneDrive files on demand is, yes, supposed to, to generate that on-demand sync capability where the user sees a list of files available and then they're, they're downloaded when the user goes to interact with them rather than downloading all of the files into the machine right away. Uh, this is Fall Creators Edition of Windows 10 and later, and it, it can be controlled via GPO. Okay, um, a question about search index. So there was a uh, Patch Server 2016 version that has a very specific search index version, 7014393, and then a subversion as well. Is there a chance to fix that on my side, or do we need to wait for a UPM fix? So this feature does have search index dependencies. That's uh, definitely one of the considerations that we called out. I'd have to check that one specifically. I believe there's a, a fix on the Citrix side for that as opposed to something you would control on your end, but I would need to go check on that subversion specifically, Pierre, unless you remember off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, I've seen I've seen a few uh, a, a few discussions between between support and customers. Uh, so uh, definitely, that's something Citrix should fix. But uh, if you can open a support case, then uh, usually you could get you could get a private quite quite quickly. Perfect. Thanks, Pierre. 
Okay, next one on the list. Are there any performance considerations, i.e. increased log on times for mounting the VHD at login for the UPM native Outlook search experience? Pierre, you want to cover that one? Yeah, so we, we've made sure we, we made sure the impacts would be uh, minimal. Plus, uh, Outlook is also uh, uh, Outlook. Sorry, uh, UPM is also doing a lot of uh, optimization regarding streaming, etc. So we've made sure that uh, the new feature would not uh, increase um, the login time a lot. Uh, and from the feedback. Uh, from our customers, I have not heard any uh, any concern about uh, the login time increase so far. Great, that's the same I've seen on my end, but that's definitely good information to have. Um, okay, how is the size of the OST VHD controlled? Is there a maximum? So most customers are just controlling this with uh, GPO the way that you would limit OST size um, for for any other use case outside of the Citrix capabilities, so limiting the number of days that are synced, maybe limiting whether we're syncing um, public folders and those sorts of things. Uh, I'm not aware of a way to control it specifically on the UPM side, but you can still control it with the, uh, the GPOs that exist to do just that on the, the Windows side or the Microsoft side of the house. Uh, does UPM cache the OneNote cache? So today it, it does not. Again, it is specific to the uh, Outlook capabilities. Is is OneNote something that we're looking at, Pierre, at all? Um, not that I'm aware of, but that's uh, that's a really good suggestion because um, that that's the kind of things we've not received a lot of requests. Uh, regarding OneNote, uh, actually, to the best of my knowledge, but uh, that's definitely the kind of things that uh, uh, could leverage the existing technology we've uh, engineered for um, the Outlook cache. So uh, I will check with the team uh, and discuss it with them. Great suggestion, anyway. Okay, uh, next one on the list here is the share file aggregation feature, uh, so the on-demand sync capability available for Zen Desktop Platinum customers without having the full share file entitlement. I believe that requires share file enterprise. I will definitely double check, but I believe it does require the, uh, the share file en enterprise entitlement. Okay, Sarah, I actually think that that takes us to the, uh, the end of our list here. So uh, unless any others come in real quick, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. Those were some really great questions and different than this morning. So we've got a, a nice library for the follow-up blog. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Again, we really appreciate your support for the series and hope you found this hour to be informative. Um, again, September 27th is um, Citrix on Azure, so make sure to, to come back and join us for that event. Otherwise, again, thank you for your time, and uh, we look forward to, to chatting again next month. Take care.